after a delay due to unforeseen circumstances, one being Wizards of the Coast mucking things up spectacularly, the other being uh, uh, unforeseen hard drive failure. We are ready to go. And it's on to Nintendo Power 102 for November of 1997. And are you ready for some football? Our cover game for this issue is the NFL Quarterback Club 1998. The letter's calling me a letter hoping there will be rumble support with Earthbound 64. Well, that's going to require an Earthbound 64, and we ain't getting that. In the power charts, we have one new title for the N64 this issue. New in a relative term as sense of being new to the list with Tetrasphere. We have an article contrasting NFL Quarterback Club 1998 and Madden 64. I've already viewed Madden 64, so I'll be covering quarterback club 98 instead the article itself has comparisons between the two of graphics game modes and team lineups with quarterback club having the actual nfl license they have team names instead of just a players association now quarterback club Whoa, feels better to play than madden 64 even on the easy difficulty which basically just has the qb pass to whoever is the most open receiver and puts the onus on the person holding the controller to get that receiver to where the ball is going to be but still has a real sense of challenge to it. I admit that in the game I was capturing footage for here, I not only did badly, but I only got one touchdown. That said, I also felt that those failings were due to how I played. And with how the pass selection worked out, odds were good that whoever the computer selected to pass to was probably just as good as who I would have selected if I had control of receiver selection, combined with possibly having problems juggling controlling the quarterback and controlling the receiver. In all, I think I had more fun, actually, with NFL Quarterback Club 98 than I did with Madden. Second and ten. One other thing. This game, like Madden, requires an entire, entire memory card worth of save debt. As far as like, the stock memory card. Somebody, anybody, needs it to come with something like the Memory Card Pro that's been put out for the PlayStation 1 for the N64. A memory card adapter that takes a micro SD card which I can put in my controller and uses that as a uh, larger memory card. So I don't have to shuffle 50 different memory cards to handle all these oversized game saves for bloody sports games. We also have a preview for Diddy Kong Racing for the N64. We have information on the various biomes that are used for the game's tracks, along with the various characters of the game, including Conker, who has yet to do the shift from mascot character to... Um, mature immature get mature rated immature game character along with um the different types of vehicles that will also appear in the various races the game is actually out by this point by my checking of release date information since that's consistent now so time to give it a review diddy kong racing does something well that mario kart was missing Coming up with a solid, sort of whole hub and spoke mechanism for doing kart racing instead of just sticking you in a series of regular races through each cup. Instead, by adding having the hub and spoke system along with different types of vehicles, cars, hovercraft, and airplanes, you also get with this an environment you can explore with various collectibles that can allow you to unlock later cups earlier than you could otherwise. I mean, if you get stuck, you have some room to continue progression. Additionally, the controls are incredibly solid to a degree that they're even better than the controls in Mario Kart 64, with the special vehicle controls also being very intuitive. It's interesting to see Nintendo getting schooled on the genre they popularized by a game they published themselves just from a different developer. Now, they're going to retake the top spot for later games, but still, it's clear that at this point, Diddy Kong Racing makes Mario Kart 64 its dust. Continuing with racing games, we have San Francisco Rush, on the N64. We have notes on the game structure and the various vehicles that are available at the start of the game, along with several track maps. Now, San Francisco Rush has some tremendously bizarre design decisions that were made in this game's development. Decisions like courses and career road are selected at random, which means a new player could end up taking the hardest course of the game as their first track, or a racer, any racer, <clears throat> not just a human controlled one, wipes out. The game will reset the racer that wiped out at the point in the pack that they were before. If you wipe out in third, it'll drop you in third. If you wipe out at first, it will pop you right back in first place. Sort of. 
But this leads to situations where, for example, if the game puts you on the reversed and mirrored version of a course that is consequently listed as being tremendously hard, where you end up taking some turns in high speed that you should be able to take on the normal version, but not this version, which also the AI racers do this too, What's your name? causing them to wipe themselves out in a bunch of spectacular fireballs, putting you in first place. The game will then reset those racers, dropping you right back to the back of the pack, ruining the rubber banding effect of all of this. It's a decision that makes me scratch my head from numerous standpoints. Three, two, Want the AI one, to try and race the best right. line in a slightly less than optimal manner. Not just because it's the smart way to race, but because it also teaches the player of where the best line is, where to slow down and where it's safe to floor it, all while leaving some room for creativity for the human players to get past opponents. You also want the player to be excited when their opponents ripe out, especially when you have these nice big flash explosion effects, and leave opponents biting the dust as a mechanism for player beneficial rubber banding to keep the player in the race. This is a big thing that helped makes the Burnout series so successful. But because of how the respawn rubber band, respawn in more or less a place plays out, it basically undermines and undercuts that and ruins the satisfaction of the moment. It's just frustrating and ultimately kind of dickish. In the classified information column, we have a cheat for a Super Nintendo game, specifically a way to grind for sword orbs in Secret of Mana. We also have a whole bunch of um, upcoming titles for the N64 that we get a rundown for. Not only Castlevania 64, but also titles like Hybrid Heaven and Gasp, which is released in the US as Deadly Arts as well. We have a slew of canned combos for Clay Fighter 63 and a third, which is a game I've already reviewed and I thought was crap. Our next racing game of the issue, and I believe our last one, is Midway's Top Gear Rally. Uh, well, rally racing game, with, and we get a whole bunch of information on the vehicle lineup and the track selection. So, on the one hand, Top Gear Rally is a stronger simulation racer than some of the games we've covered so far. Um, a, as a degree of granularity, vehicle control, suspension, types of tires, and so on, that other games haven't gotten into in the same way. Additionally, the actual controls of the game feel really solid and responsive. And it only took a few runs on the various tracks until I got the hand of how to handle drifting in this game and got to figuring out the optimal routes on some of the game's levels. On the other hand, this is a game is also one where you have to know the exact tuning for each vehicle and have it all figured out and the, with it the perfect line for each track in order to get enough points to advance to the next season. And God forbid you have any significant errors in how you race the track, as if you end up perpendicular with the track wall, for example, there isn't a reverse button you can use to get back up and get lined up to where you need to be. It feels odd that every generation of racing game brings with it some sort of reset in the sense of the knowledge of how to balance a racing game's difficulty, but yet here we are. We have, or at least for more serious or more, if not realistic, but co racing games using real cars. Uh, with Rush, we had the problem of, of respawning players or just racers in general when they wipe out. Here we have this very granular sense of difficulty or a very precise sense of difficulty where if you mess up them just a little bit too much, you don't get to progress. This is still a very playable game, all that said, but I did hit a point where I just came to realization of how the difficulty was, or in this case, was not tuned for players. And that was frustrating enough that I did not want to play this game anymore. We have a port for the N64 of a PC first-person shooter with Duke Nukem 64, a port of Duke Nukem 3D. I'm pretty sure the whole shake it baby thing with the strippers and the semi-adult films or more similar to escape prod, um, content is not going to appear in this port of the game. 
We do get some maps, though, of some of the game's later levels. Duke Nukem 64 is a reasonably decent port, considering the N64's limitations, both graphically and in terms of hardware. I don't believe it supports the two-fisted control scheme that GoldenEye 64 used to handle the um, one controller doing movement and one controller doing the look, which were um, a nice thing to have. But by contrast, it does use a um, a, a the ambidextrous option that the N64 controller theoretically could support, but not as many um, developers have taken advantage of with the option to have your movement be either on the C button or on the D pad. And with the uh, shoulder, with, with the shoulder button handling weapon switching and or weapon selection, and then the B or A butt and all that sort of stuff. Opera does, on the other hand, also manage to continue to consistently use a lot of the voice samples by John St. John, which were um, probably one of the more memorable portions of the game, outside from its immaturity, though that's certainly part of that. Um, also, the like the version of the Doom of the Duke theme on the main title screen does sound pretty good, uh, and. That's like the big high point stuff. However, like the graphics have suffered somewhat significantly. While it does have some of the interact interactable objects in the game's levels, it doesn't have like the working mirrors, which was kind of a big deal. Um, the again the the risque, more immature elements have been toned down, which honestly also was part of the game's selling point at the time. And the aiming on the analog stick uses an inverted Y axis with the stick basically controlling the back of Duke's head instead of his eye and aim line, which can really futz with your muscle memory and stuff, particularly if you're coming to this from having tried out Duke Dukem 3D on a computer. There's also no option for a targeting reticle, and all of that combined with issues with pointing Duke's head and the camera and all that just ended up making me motion sick. Even more frustrating, the game has no option for a sort of mid-level save or quick save or that sort of thing, which the PC version would have had, nor does it have any sort of checkpointing to make up for it. Honestly, considering the PC version will run on pretty much a potato now, um, you're better off just sticking with that rather than doing the N64 version of the game. Our last N64 game of the issue is another fighting game from Hudson. Dual Heroes, which has a unique twist. In addition to challenging the game's story mode, there is an additional gameplay mode where you play against a series of simulated fighting game players, each who have their own favorite characters and strategies. It makes for a nice twist on the concept, and this ends up becoming something that Sega would borrow for some of the later Virtual Fighter games. We get some notes on each of the main fighters in the game. Dual Heroes controls are remarkably simple. One button each for punches and kicks, plus a dedicated block button. The configuration is a little weird. B is block, A is punch, and C down is kick, with movement handled by the analog stick and Z trigger handling through the movement, which means you're controlling the game with the hands at the bottom and right, hot, right side instead of side to side. It's the least intuitive and least comfortable controls for a fighting game to, gate to date on the N64, at least if you're using the standard N64 controller instead of something like the Brawler system. Four, ready, fight. which is also doubly odd because all the other fighting games you had for the N64 at this point have used the hands on either side of the controller method because that's the logical, rational, comfortable way to play a game like this with, say, the shoulder button buffers handling um, if you're doing 3D movement, either sidestepping or hoggling for 3D movement, or that sort of thing. As it is, I don't like playing fighting games with an analog stick unless I am specifically using an arcade stick. So this felt very uncomfortable to play, even if I was able to make it to the first form of the boss. Or the final boss, I should say. Additionally, while the game has character designs by Keita Amamiya, the creator of Zerum and Garo, 
And additionally, while the game had character designs by Keita Amamiya, the creator of Zerum and Garo, they're not particularly well realized within the context of this game. I almost wish it had gotten a From Scratch remake on later version generation consoles with redone controls and redone graphics and a changed story presentation just so we can let those character designs shine in a fighting game that didn't suck. Because it sucks. As it is, like the game doesn't have the depth the players to bump the fight. It doesn't have solid controls to go with it, and it doesn't have engaging gameplay. It's and it doesn't even have a good story presented well to make tough it looking out through the mediocre to crappy gameplay worth it. It's just kind of a pain. Our final game of this issue is a new Super Nintendo game. And because while the Super Nintendo is on its way out, it's going down swinging with Kirby's Dream Land 3. The information on each of the power-ups Kirby can use, along with each of Kirby's friends who can help out with the adventure. Kirby's Dream Land 3 is a strong improvement on the earlier games in the series by giving Kirby a partner who can work with them, and who can be controlled by a second player who can respawn more or less endlessly, thus providing a scenario for parents and older siblings to play Kirby and the younger siblings to play the assist character, or vice versa, allowing an avenue for parents or older siblings to jump in and help out their kid or younger sibling in a tight spot, both letting them drop out once they've overcome that challenge and let the kid handle things on their own. In Counselor's Corner, we have some questions for Doom 64 on how to beat the Mother Demon and also just how to straight up skip to the last level. We have more tips for Donkey Kong Land 3 on the Game Boy, which again, I'm pretty sure I've covered already. In the now playing column, we finally have an also ran with FIFA 98 Road to the World Cup on the Game Boy. Ugh. In the Pack Watch column, we have a preview of the N64 version of Mortal Kombat Mythologies Sub Zero, along with a look at some of the titles from Tokyo Game Show 1997, naturally focusing exclusively on the N64. This is including some early looks at Quest 64, which is not the breakout JRPG I think Nintendo was hoping for. Yeah, the N64 ain't getting a Final Fantasy VII killer. Sorry. My pick of the of the issue is Kirby's Dream Land 3, which is a nice cap off for the series on the Super Nintendo, with Diddy Kong Racing honestly being a very close second. Um, I like how with Diddy Kong Racing, they adapted the what was becoming the standard hub model for platformers um, or what was to a kart racing game and made it work very well for handling that sort of progression. Now, next month, Hudson gets in on some of the action with Bomberman 64. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.